Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Ron Sokol. I'm the PI and the director of the CTSA grant called the Colorado Clinical and Translational Science um, Institute, or CCTSI, at the uh, University of Colorado in Denver. Um, and I've been asked to chair this session, so I thought I'd probably just chair it from up here, and that'll give them room to spread out and, and get to the microphones. Um, but what the purpose of the session was, was to speak about how the CTSAs across the country could interact with veterinarians and others interested in One Health to better um, move the agenda forward. Um, in other words, what aspects of the CTSA allow them to be interactive with veterinarian community um, to bring the attention to NIH and others of, of One Health. Um, and I must say, at our institution, we've uh, developed a collaboration between the University of Colorado and actually a separate university, Colorado State University, where Sue and Rod are at, um, and their veterinary school. We actually don't have a veterinary school at the University of Colorado. But because of the veterinary school, CSU has become a full partner of our CTSA, and that includes uh, all the other colleges as well. But I think it's really the, the veterinary school um, that drove that. There have been many collaborations in prior years um, before the CTSA and uh, CSU form this partnership. But it's really uh, been a, a wonderful experience, I think, on, on the University of Colorado side as well as the CSU side. And maybe what we should start off is with asking each of the panelists to describe their experience uh, from the um, School of Veterinary Medicine side. And um, I think uh, they've already been introduced to you. I know that Deborah has a few slides. So maybe what we could do is uh, put on the slides. We were asked not to bring slides, so I didn't, but Deborah did. So. <laughs> We actually all did. We're, we're trained up on PowerPoint. Um, I felt like it might be reasonable to give a little bit of background on what COI is. We keep referring to it throughout throughout the morning. And so um, I'm, I'm from Tufts University, and Tufts has a tradition of one medicine. Uh, a former president was a MD nutritionist, and he basically said, we will have a vet school, and we will have a school in nutrition. And so Tufts has medical, dental, veterinary, nutrition, and a will to do one medicine. So for a while, the Vet students and the med students actually attended class in the same classrooms for their preclinical work. So there's, there's a tradition there. We're also uh, very pleased to have a, a PI on our CTSA, Harry Zelker, who um, in the second cycle of the CTSA at Tufts um, believed that it was important enough to have one of the two signature programs at Tufts be One Health. And so the other was comparative effectiveness research, but the second was One Health. And so Lisa Freeman is here somewhere. I can't see where. She's our CTSA director of One Health at Tufts. And so as we became more involved as a vet school, we started thinking about the evolution of vet schools relative to CTSAs. And for a while, there were only four institutions um, that had vet schools and CTSAs. But more recently, it's, that number has jumped up to about 10. And so, um, so in thinking about that, we, we, we thought about, you know, what are the CTSA goals? And so, so these are historically kind of the goals of the larger consortium of CTSAs in terms of translational science, uh, accelerating that translation into treatments, uh, considering the entire spectrum of translational research, and really importantly, training a new generation of clinical and translational researchers, as well as engaging communities. So I think most of you know there's over 60 CTSAs in the country, excuse me, and, um, and these are really broad coalitions in most cases, not just academic uh, communities, but also uh, funding agencies, NIH centers, um, and there's a broad range of diseases and, and uh, entities being addressed by these. So, so the conversation um, evolved to saying, well, you know, we have these nine or ten veterinary institutions um, that have CTSAs and therefore share some of these goals and priorities. So why don't we try to put something together? And so in July of uh, 2014, it really started with a meeting of, of the deans from I think at that point it was about seven or eight of these institutions, um, and ask, is it worthwhile to, to try to work together to, to have a higher impact? And so, so our mission is very simple, advancing the understanding of diseases shared by humans and animals, um, and doing what we've talked a lot about today, which is leveraging expertise. And I think that's, that's the focus. It's not promoting one health. It's really leveraging expertise to solve problems and to address the well-being of humans, animals, and the environment, and doing that collaboratively, 
and by really hopefully generating greater resources than you could individually. I don't think you can see much of this, but it, it lists the, the 10 institutions right now, and, and that's out of currently, we do have 30 vet schools now nationally, and, and so a good third of them um, are at institutions with CTSAs, and so that's a, that's a pretty good critical mass. Um, there are four priority areas that we've identified, again, by taking guidance from the CTSA priorities um, to set up a series of four subcommittees within COHA. Those are clinical studies, tissue and DNA banking, clinical scientist education, and communication and collaboration. I think you've seen all of these themes mirrored today. So, um, so we have these, co these uh, subcommittees, and they are uh, chaired or co-chaired. In the case of clinical studies, Dottie Brown from Penn and Eric Weisner from UC Davis um, are sort of characterizing the breadth of veterinary clinical trials, resources, expertise, and then trying to make recommendations for how we advance better operating procedures and facilitating these multi-institutional tasks. And so, uh, uh, Ron, if it's okay with you, I was going to invite um, Cheryl to comment because she is on this subcommittee and maybe talk a little bit about what that subcommittee is up to. Yeah. You have any So um, part of the goal of the clinical trial subcommittee is to really find out how various uh, veterinary schools that have CTSAs and are integrated with them are running clinical trials and um, sort of the, the, the structure for how the clinical trials are run, uh, how uh, data is captured, how it's analyzed, and how that data is really integrated with the One Health mission. And so we've conducted some surveys to get feedback from other institutions and are working to develop a cohesive method to institute clinical trials across these institutions so that we can capture data in a coordinated manner that can then be readily translated back to um, basically the human arena. So that when we do engage in uh, research, particularly in spontaneous disease models, we can rapidly take data from multiple sites and uh, coordinate it and feed it back to a translational effort in a meaningful way. And right now, there are a number of institutions that are doing lots of clinical trial work, but they're not really linked or connected. And so it makes it difficult to work among these institutions. So the goal is to sort of really even it out and make it a coordinated effort. Thank you. So the next um, subcommittee is tissue, tissue and DNA banking, and the subcommittee chairs are, are Sue and Ammon Peck from Florida. So Sue, would you like to um, see? You've got some slides, right? I do have slides because I'll forget the names of everybody who's participating in, in this effort. But um, I'm Sue Vanderwood from Colorado State University, and I first wanted to just um, echo uh, Ron's comments that it's been a pleasure to work with the University of Colorado Denver um, and to participate in their CTSA. I think some of our comments here today, we've implied that the medical schools maybe don't recognize the efforts of the veterinary school or maybe appreciate us, but I think that in our experience working with Ron and UC Denver that it's been a very collaborative um, and very productive um, interaction and just glad to be able to publicly thank Ron for his efforts in, in providing that kind of a relationship. Um, so here's our two campuses, and I did take the liberty of putting the ram's head over the uh, University of Colorado uh, logo here to, for my presentation, so sorry, Ron, for that. Um, so the Tissue and DNA Banking um, Biorepository Subcommittee, um, I started out as chair, but very um, thankfully, Dr. Almond Peck at University of Florida uh, was um, agreed to be the chair at our most recent meeting, and then Sue Lana, who's um, an expert in, in our uh, Cancer Center at CSU in biorepository methods is a co-chair providing some clinical expertise, and then we have representatives from a number of the other veterinary colleges. And um, as Cheryl mentioned, there are in independent efforts in biorepository management at not only vet schools, but at larger veterinary clinics. And so the goal of this committee is to really archive what's out there, figure out a way to have infrastructure that might coordinate these efforts, and then also um, to try to develop a process for how you would provide samples from well phenotyped um, individuals. And I think one thing that we can do at high quality academic veterinary institutions um, and also in high quality practices is to provide samples that have been very clearly phenotyped, which is, as all of you know, is really 
important when we're doing molecular typing and tissue typing that we have started off with things that we know um, what they looked like in a clinical context. So um, some progress we've made here that's been very exciting is that um, Amin's relationship with the University of Florida, Florida CTSA is that he's part of their committee on um, their biorepository at the CTSA at Florida. And that group has, has um, agreed and is interested in providing their biorepository expertise to the veterinary community. So we're, our next conference call will talk to the directors of the CTSA biorepository of Florida to, to work out some details. But for very minimal to, to uh, little cost, to no cost, actually, um, at least the way, the way we understand it now, we may be able to provide samples to them, have them archive them in their standard formatting, and also to be able to provide tissue samples to those that requested. Of course, we, would, we wouldn't know exactly what to send them or how to coordinate this, so the second part of our, of our um, mission would be to try to determine what samples would be most valuable. And one of the things we've talked about is to look at the Office of Rare Disease Biorepository as a model. And I think one thing that's come out quite a bit today is that one of the areas where these clinical trials can be particularly useful in comparative um, medicine is to look at rare diseases where there may be, it may be difficult to accrue human patients, but there's enough veterinary patients, especially in a multi-center site, to, to be able to utilize um, in an informed way. So, those are the two things that this committee is working on. Um, I'm just going to quickly talk about the clinician scientist education panel. Um, I'm not on this, but um, this is being managed by Lauren Trepernier, Wisconsin, and has very good representation um, across the veterinary colleges that are participating in COHA. And this um, subcommittee goals are to look at educational opportunities, particularly for clinical scientist training for veterinarians. Um, I'm going to be up later on today with a summary, and I. We'll be talking a little bit more about the Physician Scientist Workforce Report, which Michael already mentioned, but um, this is very relevant to the, to the um, focus of this group. Um, and they have developed a couple of white papers or proposals that are, they're looking at, and that includes looking at DVM-PhD combined funding, um, combined training funding through the CTSA, how they'd envision a two-year postdoctoral residency fellowship for training and translational research and then early career faculty boot camp to bolster those careers of those individuals. Thank you. So, so I would just also give Lauren Trepanier credit. Uh, back when there were only four institutions, uh, four veterinary institutions that had CTSAs, she really began to do cross um, CTSA work in that clinician scientist mode back in 2009. So, um, so it's been an idea that's evolved. So the last group, the fourth subcommittee, is communication and collaboration, which we've heard a lot about today. And again, Lisa Freeman, I can't see because of the lights, um, is the chair of this committee. And they're developing uh, priorities and an implementation plan to, to increase the awareness of capabilities of veterinary schools and, and COHA and the network to support really good science. And so fostering collaborations, increasing and encouraging transdisciplinary grant seeking is, is, a, is a goal. Uh, some of the things that they have going already, we've started trying to place One Health tracks at major medical meetings. The American Society of Nutrition was just in Boston, and, and Lisa organized a one, a one Nutrition track for that meeting. I think Michael Larimore also recently had a, a, a similar track at a vascular meeting. Um, so, so that's kind of a charge for all of the COHA members is to do that, to carry the message out a little bit. Uh, regional symposium we've talked about, uh, One Health columns in medical journals. Really, the purpose being not so much to be the cheerleader for One Health, but rather to make people aware of capabilities and to, as I think Andrew Lackner said, to, to allow uh, optimization of teams to solve problems. And so that's, we consider that last subcommittee to be very key. Uh, quickly then, where are we? Uh, ne next steps, um, we have partnered with AAVMC, the Association of American Veterinary Medical Colleges, and signed an MOU across the institutions involved in COHA. We're all going to ante up a certain amount of money and then try to um, uh, run a competitive grants process to do some pilot funding to, to really bring people together across the, the alliance. Um, we are also very pleased that as of Friday, I think that um, PAR 15, 173, and 172 were released 
And these are um, collaborative innovation awards uh, through the CTSA program. And because of the way those awards are set up, we feel like there's a, a lot of potential to use the alliance to, to help put together some compelling proposals. And Ron will probably have more to say about that. Um, finally, we've been asked by a lot of our colleagues in the, in the veterinary world, um, can we join? Is, is COA open to everyone? And that would be the ultimate goal, is whatever work we accomplish through this, that we'd be able to extend that so that the full uh, capacity, if you will, of, of veterinary investigators can be brought to bear on, on problems that we both care about for the sake of human health as well as animal health. So Ron, thank you very much for giving us that, that time. Well, first, let me just ask, are there any comments on, on what you just heard? Because I wanted to uh, just give you a bit of a perspective from the uh, CTSA program, the direction that the national program is taking us. But um, there was a, a lot of material there, so I, I just want to know if anybody had any comments before I go on. Yes. I just had a question about the, the subcommittee on um, education of clinician scientists. Is that done in parallel with training physicians to be clinician scientists, or is it by design separated into veterinary and, and human medicine? The focus, I think, is really veterinary trainees. Um, you guys correct me if I'm wrong. Um, with the thinking being that there's perhaps more resources available typically to house officers and fellows in a medical setting, setting to be to train as clinician scientists than there may be for veterinary house officers. So it's, it's really the interns and the residents, mostly the residents, that have been the target of that. Yeah, I, I just copied somebody else's notes, so I can't be 100% sure. But I, I do believe that there are, particularly in at uh, veterinary colleges, this would be a source of funding that would be maybe modeled after some of the programs that are ongoing at medical institutions but aren't necessarily directly interacting. You know, one thing that I would mention that's been interesting at Tufts, um, because of a different connection, not related to COHA at all, our house officers have started spending a week on medical rotations at Tufts Medical Center. And uh, though it's, it's not a structured curriculum, it's been a, a wonderful experience and has worked very well both from the people they're working with and themselves to learn about the commonalities. Well, that's kind of why I, I was asking this is we've, we've done it with the direction of the veterinary students or veterinary trainees going to the human hospital. But I actually think it's more effective to do it the other way. And, and I say that because we just last year started a um, a translational medicine fellowship for oncology where a fellow from the med school has to come over and spend a month with us doing clinical trials in animals. They go to the Veterinary Cancer Society meeting and, and listen to those presentations and then they come back and teach to the residents. And it's, it's had a profound effect on both directions, but it's an immediate way to educate that person who then sort of becomes our ambassador at the med school. And so I guess I'd like to see us make that more bi-directional than it's been in the past. Any other comments? Yes, Rod. Um, hi, it's Rod Page from CSU. Um, so you guys are um, be really uh, applauded for taking this on. And I, if I'm not mistaken, it's not funded. So <laughs> you're, do, you're doing this out of, the, uh, out of the future benefit that that will bring in. Perhaps, Ron, you might have some words about the potential for future support for some of this stuff or how that might look over time in terms of uh, NCAT's uh, overarching goals for something like this? Well, well let me just then, then mention a few things. Um, for, first, let me comment on the Innovation Awards. So this was one of the recommendations from the Institute of Medicine's review of the CTSA program from two years ago, and then NCAT's brought on a committee that um, reviewed the IOM report and wrote their own report. Um, but both of them agreed that uh, it would behoove the CTSA program to have an innovation fund of relatively large dollars that could be um, applied for in a competitive way by groups of CTSAs that would collaborate with each other, so it would promote collaboration, and would take on a major roadblock, obstacle, um, some new approach method um, process to speed the translational process. This is a major goal now of NCATS, is to accelerate in a safe and less expensive way the process of bringing discoveries into patient care, better health, et cetera. Um, so with that, the Innovation Fund um, was developed. 
And uh, I don't know if anybody's here from NCATS, but I think what I'm saying isn't controversial. Yes? <laughs> okay. Um, but NCATS is uh, reducing all the CTSA budgets gradually. Um, and whether this is uh, willful to free up extra funds or not, I'll leave it for you to decide. But some of those extra funds are being put into this innovation fund. And the commitment of this new PAR is to um, put $9 million towards funding maybe 10 to 15 awards, um, which can be up to five-year awards, up to a million dollars of direct costs, direct costs per year for a clinically oriented innovation proposal, or $500,000 direct costs for a per year for up to five years for a non-clinical um, project. Now, it's not exactly clear where does clinical and non-clinical end, but the RFA just came out last Friday, and I'm sure we'll hear more information from NCATS to define this. So I think this is a perfect opportunity um, if one could make the case, and you're going to have to make the case, that, uh, for instance, clinical trials in natural animal models would actually speed the process, not slow the process down of, of bringing a, a drug to market. Um, if one could make the case, and if you had three or more CTSAs, and you have nine or 10, um, one could go in as a group uh, with a proposal. Um, there's certain criteria that you have to meet, and as I looked through it before just to be sure, I really think it would virtually meet all of the criteria. I think the catch would be whether or not NCATS is interested in clinical trials or clinical studies in natural animal models, whether they believe that that's part of their mission or not. And I don't know the answer. I can tell you there's many CTSA grants, such as ours, where natural animal models, cores, and trials were part of the grant application and actually received excellent reviews, and we were funded. However, NCATS has changed the RFA one year ago and changed the direction of the program more towards supporting multi-site clinical trials in humans, and particularly NIH multi-site clinical trials. So uh, I just don't know whether or not this uh, it would be looked upon by NCATS or not. And I think it could take a few phone calls and, and figure that out. Um, what I did want to mention was just to point out six areas that the CTSA program nationally is working on for the past year, and I'm sure some of these innovation awards and some of these other new RFAs that NCATS is going to be issuing shortly um, will address these six specific areas. But I think it's worth it for all of you to keep in mind if you're talking about building a network of clinical trial sites for, uh, for, for animals, and particularly natural animals, uh, that these are areas that you, you should think of at the start and not have to refine later, which is essentially what all of us are doing. Um, and this is really to improve effectiveness and efficiency. So let me just run through these real quickly. The first is cohort identification and feasibility assessment. So it's very uh, common for a neurologist to say, I have 100 patients with Duchenne's, and I have 100, and I have 100. Oh, we, have, we need five sites, and we'll have 500 patients. And then when it comes to enrolling the patients, there's actually 20% of them that are actually available for the study. So the idea is to actually do cohort identification up front before choosing sites. And in the medical field, the way this is going to work is through electronic health records. So you all know that all hospitals now either have or are installing an electronic health record. And there are now ways to mine the data, looking at uh, diagnostic codes, et cetera, and age and, and gender, et cetera, mine that data locally using a variety of different software packages. And you can link that up nationally now so that actually a third party could review 30 sites across the country in, in 10 minutes um, with a certain gr um, group of criteria as enrollment criteria for a study and not only decide whether the whole cohort can be identified and there's enough patients, but also exactly which sites have which patients. Now, I, I know you don't all use uh, electronic health record and certainly not a uniform one, but if you have local databases where you maintain the numbers, this might be something to consider building into a proposal or at least planning on this because this really will help speed conducting any clinical trial, whether it's in humans or in, in natural animal models. So that's number one. Uh, number two are efforts to improve recruitment. And I think our 
challenges with recruitment may be a little different than yours, recruitment and enrollment in clinical trials. But messaging is so important, and messaging really changes across the country, um, depending on uh, ethnicity and minority groups and others, um, to really um, talk to somebody about what it means to be in a clinical trial and what the consent form means in a language they can understand. So there's a, a national effort on that. The third um, has to do with uh, improving the rapidity of IRB approval, and I, I don't know if most of you know, but for many multi-site studies, um, if there's 15 sites, that's 15 different IRBs we have to work with, and that can delay a study for a full year in getting all the IRBs to agree. Um, if, you, if you're in medicine and you run an industry-sponsored study, generally industry uses out external IRBs, such as a one called Western IRB. And basically, every site submits to that one IRB. They do one review. They look at everybody's consent forms. But the speed of approval is much more enhanced. So uh, NCATS is moving towards uh, getting CTSAs to agree to something called an IRB reliance agreement, which means that there's one IRB of record kind of like a central IRB, but not completely. But there's one IRB that does the scientific review, if, and they make the um, changes in the protocol and the approval. And each site's IRB still have some responsibility, but the central, if you will, IRB, the IRB of record, has much more responsibility. And again, the idea here is to have one scientific review and not 15 different scientific reviews. Um, the fourth area has to do with budgeting and contracting. And each institution has their own quirks and attorneys and wording and indemnification clauses, et cetera, that have to be worked out with every company or other sponsor if there's an externally sponsored trial. And uh, nationally now 60, I think, of the CTSAs have agreed, and working with a number of the major big pharma companies, have agreed on a templated language that um, will only change with the specifics about the trial, but all the typical legal jargon that has to go up and back and up and back, they just agreed on, and again, probably eliminated months and months of negotiations that, that are pretty much unnecessary if you could agree up front. So that's another thing to consider. I think you, you probably have a pretty good idea who the major players would be in the pharmaceutical industry world and, and maybe the nutrition world that would be involved in clinical trials in animals. Um, two more. One is a good clinical practice training. And uh, believe it or not, most of our institutions, even though we're doing clinical trials and clinical studies on humans, most of our institutions don't have a GCP requirement for investigators. Now, many investigators take courses and get trained and have a pretty good idea what GCP is, but uh, we all have to have IRB and HIPAA certification, but not GCP training. So again, the CTSA program nationally is working on web-based modules of GCP training, and depending on what your role is in a study, whether you're an investigator or a study coordinator, or a regulatory person, you take different modules. Um, a lot of this is already set up at, at the uh, city module, CITI out of Miami, but it's gonna be formalized. And, and this is critical if the data are ever gonna be used for FDA for pre-approval of a drug or, or for approval of a drug particularly. If it's not done with GCP standards, the FDA won't accept the data. And finally, the last thing has to do with local studies. So many of us, uh, we've heard a lot about pilot studies, and pilot studies are generally what jumpstarts almost every new idea, new target, get preliminary data, et cetera. And certainly for all of our grants, those are critical to be able to generate the preliminary data. Uh, the CTSA program is now working on standardizing how we review and approve pilot studies across the network, because every CTSA is required to have a pilot grant program. Ours is about $1.2 million a year. Some are up to four or five million. Some are a bit, little bit less. But most CTSAs uh, issue 20, 30, 40 pilot grants per year. And uh, the local review of those is left to the CTSA. So now there's a movement to standardize that. And it's not going to be very tricky, but uh, it, there probably are sites who don't review it in a peer-reviewed fashion like most of us would think would be ideal. 
So again, those are six areas that the national CTSA program is working on. I think virtually all of them would apply to animal clinical trials. It's probably best to keep these in mind at the start rather than, again, having to, to, to redo things. The last thing I wanted to mention has to do with that innovation RFA, and, and it was mentioned before, but I just want to reiterate. In the uh, RFA, it's actually a program announcement, um, it does state that the PI on the grant has to come from a CTSA institution, but that they can have other institutions, even industry partners and other partners in the grant um, as uh, full participants um, without being at a CTSA institution. But the, the PI has to be at a CTSA. So it, so it actually is possible to even extend it beyond your, your eight or nine institutions if you so desired it at this, at this point. So we're almost out of time. Maybe we'll open it up and see if there's a couple minutes for questions. One question. Yes. One question. Yeah, Carol. I had a question about the clinical trials survey and whether that is being conducted as a feasibility study, or could you elaborate more on what that's for? So the survey was conducted really just to get a sense of what people were doing across sites um, in terms of what the structure of their units were, um, what sort of software they were using, if any you know, software was being used, and to get a sense of what the landscape is like. Because I think there's a huge variation in what a clinical trial look, unit looks like across institutions. So at Ohio State, um, I run our clinical trials office, which started out as just two people, and now we have 10 full-time staff members. Um, so we have nurses on the floor, we have an administrative assistant, um, and we are receiving support from our CTSA, and we're a shared resource of our cancer center as well. Um, and so, and you know, we're integrating with REDCap right now, and so all of our clinical trials will be done with REDCap. We have a network of 1,500 clinics that we contact uh, to advertise clinical trials. We use Constant Contact to maintain that, that network, and so that may be very different than other institutions where um, the unit is less well-developed and not used by everybody. And so at our institution, at Ohio State, the investigators are required to work with our, C our clinical trials office. So everybody has to flow through. We know everything that's going on, and we maintain sort of the landscape. But that doesn't happen everywhere. So really, the goal of the survey was to sort of understand what the differences were and to try to develop a platform that would be equitable across um, the various institutions and something that could be implemented rather quickly. That's terrific. For those of you who may not know what REDCap is, it stands for Research Electronic Data Capture, and it's a software database system that Vanderbilt developed um, that's based on Excel spreadsheets, but is much, much more than that. It's web-based, it's backed up on servers, and very importantly for the human world, it's HIPAA compliant, whereas Access and Excel are not HIPAA compliant. So most CTSAs have it installed, it's open source, and uh, it's used now literally by thousands of investigators around the world. And I just wanted to add about REDCap, one of the really nice things about it is you can um, develop a library of case report forms that then can be shared by the entire user group. So if we were to load our case report forms up into REDCap, then any of the other cohort institutions could automatically just download them. And it really speeds up the process of putting together you know, studies, essentially. Yeah. And because it's web-based, it can be multi-site. Yeah. It's just not FDA compliant completely if you're doing a registration trial, but that's a separate point. Uh, along, the, Carol Robertson flew with Lily, along the same lines is, uh, while there are IACUCs at every single institution, uh, it seems like different institutions approach the clinical trial approval process a little differently. Is that something that you're looking into with the survey? And are there clinical yes. trial review committees specifically looking at the enrolling of naturally occurring disease? So types? yes, we're looking at that as well. And I think, um, so the experience at all institutions is slightly different. Um, there are some institutions where IACUC is absolutely required no matter what you're doing. Uh, there are some institutions where there is a hospital review board that is sort of a secondary review. Um, and then there are other institutions where there isn't as formalized a structure. 
the way we have it at Ohio State right now is that any uh, clinical trial that goes beyond a standard of care intervention requires IACUC approval. Otherwise, you get a waiver similar to an IRB waiver, and that's a formal waiver letter. But we also have a secondary hospital committee that acts as sort of an internal IRB that approves things. So there's two levels of approval that are required. Uh, but every institution is slightly different, and I actually just got a query from Cornell's College of Veterinary Medicine because they're sort of wrangling with the issue of what does a, a IACUC waiver mean, and how should that be worded, and what qualifies for a waiver. So being from Cornell and having actually... Excuse, excuse, excuse me, sorry to interrupt, but we will have more time at the end oh, of sure. this question. So sorry to cut you, but we have to be, keep it on time. I guess we're at I, break, right? Yeah, we'll have a break, but I, I want to remind you, yes, we have... We have up to 45 minutes at the end of the, the session. So, and remember, you can email, you, have, you can, we have more time for comments. Okay? Great. 